Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his article, What is Philosophy as a Way of Life?, John Sellers provide some very helpful clarifications and a typology. Now, why do we need this? This term philosophy as a way of life has been thrown around a lot in recent decades. It also sometimes corresponds to earlier discussions about this in other philosophers or people within the broader culture going back several centuries. And I would say there's a lot of confusion about precisely what philosophy as a way of life consists in. And so providing an overview and a typology of different views on that is, is very helpful clarificatory work. So at the very beginning of the article, John Sellers says that the phrase is closely associated with the French philosopher and scholar of ancient philosophy, Pierre Adot, whose work gained prominence in the English-speaking world in 1995 with the publication of a book called Philosophy as a Way of Life. And so you could say that that crystallized a lot of uh, discussions about this sort of thing and gave a lot of people the impression that, that Hado was sort of the central person. And, you know, if you read Hado's work, of course, there's lots and lots of references to ancient philosophy, but his conception of philosophy as a way of life is not just confined to ancient philosophy. He's willing to, you know, consider all sorts of people all the way up to, say, the existentialist movement as engaging in philosophy as a way of life. So the way that uh, Sellers summarizes this is in the chapter from which the volume gets its title, Hado claims that in antiquity, philosophy was a way of life, a mode of existing in the world, which had to be practiced at each instant, the goal of which was to transform the whole of the individual's life. Philosophy is conceived as a love of wisdom, and wisdom, Hado says, does not merely cause us to know, it causes us to be in a certain way. And this is a very helpful way of talking about ancient philosophy and what was going on in there. Ado is, of course, not the only person singling this out. You know, uh, Maurice Blondel, already back in, you know, the 1890s, and then in his teaching is talking about, uh, you know, how philosophy has to be lived through action and using uh, classical examples. Alistair McIntyre would be another prime example you know, still alive today, but working uh, definitely at the same time as Ado, talking about tradition-constituted rationalities from after virtue on. So it's not a radically new idea, but there is something that, that is, is valuable in bringing this out. Hado views philosophy in this sense, philosophy as a way of life, as an art of living, and, you know, Sellers ends up saying that this is, this can be understood as something that happened in this ancient conception of philosophy, different than, than doing philosophy uh, as it's often done today. Uh, he says the important point for the present purposes is not only how philosophy was one conceived long ago, but also, here's where we get the popularity of philosophy as a way of life, a live metaphilosophical option that has been taken up by philosophers throughout the history of philosophy and can still be taken up today. So what does that mean, a metaphilosophical option? This is a philosophical conception of what philosophy is about, what it's doing. And this is actually touching on a really central issue, which is that philosophy, if you go and look for a definition of it, any definition you get is going to be wrong in the sense that 
most philosophers are not going to accept your definition. Most practitioners of the discipline will not accept any particular definition that you put forward. Uh, this is a historical fact about philosophy, but also points to something quite important. That, that's a subject for another conversation. So it's okay to do metaphilosophy with the understanding that what we're doing is taking a particular view on what philosophy is and what it could do and what it should do. Sellers says, this is all good. Let's see if we can flesh this conception out a little bit more. And so he's making some additional contributions to the conversation. He says, I take philosophy as a way of life to involve the following things. First, that the ultimate motivation of philosophy is to transform one's way of life. Now notice he doesn't say just one's life, one's way of life. That's quite important. Second, that there should be some connection and consistency between somebody's stated philosophical ideas and their behavior. They, as we say, don't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. So if you're going to do philosophy as a way of life, it doesn't mean that there has to be a perfect coincidence between these, but there'd better be some effort to make, that, make sure that there's some consistency going between what it is that you're endorsing and what it is that you're actually doing. I think that's, that's, that cannot be reinforced enough. And then the third thing, he says, actions are ultimately more philosophically significant than words to the point that it's possible to determine someone's set of philosophical beliefs by examining their biography and behavior. Very interesting point there, isn't that? That means that the way in which a person lives and what we know about them is you know, not just sort of extra stuff, but it's directly important for assessing whether they believe certain things. So these are some really great ways of, as he says, fleshing the conception out. Throughout the rest of the paper, he is examining uh, and working out a number of different viewpoints that he summarizes close to the end. And he tells us, here we go, that there are, uh, in light of what we've discussed so far, we might point to three distinct views about philosophy as a way of life. And these represent, you could say, polar positions that some people within the, if there is a movement of philosophy as a way of life, some people emphasize more than others. I think he's completely right to single these out as distinct views. So the first one, philosophy as a way of life is a distinct tradition in Western philosophy, different in form and motivation from both analytic and continental philosophy, dominant in antiquity and present ever since, albeit marginalized in recent times. So this goes to the part of the, the paper where he's talking about, well, is it a third way to analytic and continental philosophy, which are at least in the Anglo-American sphere and arguably in European philosophy, pretty much the dominant uh, paradigms for how philosophy ought to be done. We often talk of the analytic continental divide, right? As if that's, that's a, a real thing. And it is sociologically real in certain, uh, certain degrees. There's a lot more that could be said about that, but we're going to skip over that. So is it a distinct tradition? We might actually think of it as a distinct set of interlocking traditions that are often in communication with themselves. I'll mention again Alistair McIntyre, who has done so much for arguing the need to have a, a new Aristotelian uh, sort of tradition that, that is, you know, rooted in a community and practices and all that. And then Anthony Long's wonderful article where he says, you know, McIntyre, you're perfectly right about the Aristotelians, but you're wrong in pushing the Stoics to the side because the Stoics are doing the same sort of thing. They're sort of like a parallel tradition. And we know there's a lot of confluence between them in ancient times as well. Um, so, you know, the, it is definitely a, a different way, a different approach to what's typically understood as analytic and continental philosophy. I think John Sellers is right in saying, well, I don't want to call it entirely a third way. There's, there's some problematic aspects of that. There's all sorts of third ways. We could say, well, what about classical American philosophy? What about, you know, uh, comparative philosophy? What about, 
All, you know, we can go on and on and on. Obviously, the analytics and continentals, though they'd like to say that they're the only games in town, they're not. And so I think Sellers is right that philosophy as a way of life cuts across the divide. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to say that you can find some analytic philosophers in the history of analytic philosophy who are clearly engaged in philosophy as a way of life. John Wisdom is a prime example, although John Wisdom is, of course, reading Sartre and engaging not just with, with you know, Wittgenstein, but also with psychoanalysis and, and things like that. So, you know, I, I would say he's, he's right in saying we don't have a, a monolithic block of analytic philosophy and then continental philosophy and then some third way between the two. Distinct view number two, uh, philosophy as a way of life is a humanist approach contrasted to be contrasted with a scientific approach and as such, perhaps sharing more in common with the work of some continental philosophers than it does with most analytic philosophy. And the two paradigms that, that Sellers is using for this humanistic approach and the what he's calling a scientific approach here are uh, Socrates and Aristotle. You know, Aristotle is, is primarily interested in knowing. Um, he does have ethics, but of course, in the Nicomachean Ethics, in Book 10, contemplation is the best kind of life, so it kind of trumps things. And there's a very strict separation between the, the theoretical and the practical, you know, two different kinds of truth. So, you know, I, I think he, he's, he's uh, right in distinguishing these. Um, now, we should mention, so what, what sort of things would they have in common with continental philosophy and what continental philosophies? Um, committed Marxism, he brings up. He talks about existentialism. Those arguably are philosophies as, as ways of life as well as continental philosophies, right? Uh, if we're talking about structuralism and a lot of post-structuralist stuff, probably not so much, right? So, you know, that's, that's worth keeping in mind. Um, Sellers also wants to stress a key point here that I think is, is very important not to leave out. The motivation of figuring out what the good life is and transforming oneself towards the good life cannot leave out what is distinctive to philosophy. And one of the things that is distinctive to philosophy, in addition to, say, being a, a, an art of living, is a motivation of knowing and articulating truth. So if it becomes, I'm going to have the good life, but I'm going to do so by believing in all sorts of things that aren't true, now you're not doing philosophy as a way of life. And, and all the classical representatives of philosophy as a way of life, for example, the Stoics or you know uh, Socrates would say, you're not doing it right. You're, you're actually just trying to make yourself feel okay. And so, you know, this prevents philosophy as a way of life from being turned into sort of a feel-good consumer item, right? Philosophy is the philosophy brand. So it can't be at the expense of the commitment to truth. This is also going to affect the distinct view number three. Philosophy as a way of life is one pole or one aspect inherent to all philosophy, sometimes marginalized but always present to a greater or lesser extent. I think we have to read in here that it's a therapeutic poll um, because that's part of what he was discussing in the section preceding that. There is this sense that philosophy is the therapy for the soul, right? And that has been a motivation in philosophy for a, you know, from the, the very inception and going on uh, down to the present. Oftentimes it is marginalized. People are like, oh, you know, philosophy is not about feelings at all. No, actually, a lot of philosophy is about feelings, you know, including, including Aristotle, who thought that feelings and emotions were quite important. Uh, that's why Heidegger, you know, in uh, Being in Time tells us that uh, in Rhetoric Book 2, Aristotle carried out one of the first hermeneutics of the, of the emotions, right, and thought that that was relevant. It's a bit of a side note there. Sellers, again, reinforces the very important point that we don't want to lose the motivation of truth and turn everything just into feel good or feel better therapy. We, you know, we have to confront reality. And the promise of philosophy as a way of life 
is that actually by confronting reality and working through the difficult things, we might actually wind up in a better state than if we just, you know, engaged in soporifics and self-helpy, you know, self-affirmation or whatever, whatever it's going to be, little band-aid patches on things. Real therapy, like Epictetus says, you know, entering into the philosophy, uh, whatever it is, teaching hall is like going to see the doctor. And remember back then there was no anesthetics, you know, and going to see a doctor was something a lot of people tried to avoid just as much as in the, the present. It's going to be painful, but it's ultimately going to be, be better for you as somebody who's got some skill and knowledge helps you uh, work things out instead of for your body, for, for your soul or for your mind or personality. So, you know, each of these distinct views represents something about the discourse of philosophy as a way of life. Um, in really good literature on philosophy as a way of life, all of these tend to be playing some role, but I think that Sellers is right to disentangle these from each other so we can assess the ideas involved in this very interesting and ongoing movement.